We're celebrating art and architecture in the garden, coming up next. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now in today's show, we've got some special places to visit, like this place. This is called Tower Grove Park. Now it's in St. Louis. You see this is a very large park open to the public and there's so many lovely examples of art and architecture tastefully, if not artfully, integrated into its landscape. Now we'll get back to this a little later in the show. But we're also going to visit the Garfield Conservatory in Chicago. Also in today's show, we'll visit the Bernice Gardens in Arkansas. Plus I'll share a few tips on adding garden ornaments to your landscape. Okay, let's get this show kicked off and explore this beautiful place. As a designer, I have to say that water, in some form, whether a garden is large or small, always improves it. And that's certainly the case here in this beautiful park. This is Tower Grove Park in St. Louis. It's a 289-acre park, and I just love this water centerpiece. The geese today are loving it as well. This is called the Fountain Pond Garden. But what makes this place particularly interesting are these faux ruins that you see here. Henry Shaw, who developed all of this, came to St. Louis when he was a teenager. He was only 19 years old. He did very well in business. And by the time he had reached middle age, he had decided, well, what am I gonna do with all this money? And he bought this track of land. And after an extended trip to Europe, came back with lots of ideas in his head. One of them, which I think is one of the most romantic, is this series of ruins. Not only was Mr. Shaw a visionary, but he was also a very resourceful man. Between 1872 and 1873, a very large hotel here in St. Louis had burned to the ground. And Mr. Shaw arranged to have 10 wagon loads of the rubble from that burned hotel hauled up here to Tower Grove Park and began the construction of these ruins from the pieces of that hotel. Pretty clever, huh? Mr. Shaw was so influenced by many of the things that he had seen in Europe, this was just one of the ideas that he had brought back. He'd been to great estates like the Chatsworth Estate in England and seen faux ruins there. Now, he also had a penchant for pavilions. You see, he wanted this park to be really a place for the people of the community to come and enjoy. And to do that, well, you needed these outdoor spaces that they could gather around and under. So he designed 10 different pavilions around this park. One of my favorites is the music stand. Let's walk over here and let's have a look. This pavilion is both exotic in its design and very colorful. This is the music stand, one of the largest pavilions that Mr. Shaw had placed here in the 1870s. While he was in Europe, he really got into music and had an opportunity to meet many of the composers of the day, such as Rossini. And to celebrate these great composers, what he did is he surrounded this pavilion with six of his favorites, included are Mozart, Beethoven, there's also Rossini and Verdi. On a regular basis, there would be concerts held here within this music stand for the public to enjoy. Now, this pavilion was restored in 1992, and even today, on a regular basis, they have concerts here in the park. Mr. Shaw's gift to St. Louis back in the 19th century is still being enjoyed by visitors today. Adding visual interest to an outdoor space with garden ornaments has been around for a long time. They can add a touch of whimsy, or, and they can certainly create a focal point which will arrest your attention. As you can imagine, there is a wide range of garden ornaments to choose from. It's just a matter of letting your imagination run wild. There are large cast iron sculptures to smaller inexpensive metal sculptures, certainly made of all forms of stone. 
You see, the idea is you just want them to be able to withstand the weather. You can even recycle items from your home. Try lining a pathway with wine bottles or even making a bottle tree. See, the possibilities are just endless. If you really want to create a wow factor in your garden, keep in mind that bigger is probably better. Smaller items tend to get lost in the garden, so that's one of the reasons to think large. And the other thing is to get creative, have a little fun with it. Located in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas, the Bernice Garden was created to celebrate community. You see, it features sculpture exhibits and host events in an effort to foster community interaction and instill a sense of pride in the neighborhood. You know, we're all familiar with the mantra, reduce, reuse, and recycle, but we tend to think of it, or at least I do, about products. But what about an entire half block of a city? We're in a very urban area, it's densely populated, and this site, which now is the Bernice Gardens, a lovely oasis in the middle of town, was once a place for a fast food restaurant. Well, it's totally transformed now. What you have here is a place for people to gather. It's a gathering point. In fact, the person who started this, Anita Davis, is all about community unity. Even though this garden really isn't that old, they've got a lot of interesting plants used in interesting ways. You have this lovely blend of old-fashioned flowers, whether they're perennials or annuals. Among the perennials, you've got daylilies, rudbeckia, purple cone flowers, and a wide range of ornamental grasses. When it comes to annuals, there are a lot of old-fashioned favorites like these vinca, coleus, marigolds, zinnias, and cosmos. They've also integrated herbs into the landscape. Just look at this big block of rosemary, but you can also find dill and beautiful mounds of artemisia. And take a look at the sculpture. It's all throughout this garden. Some of it's permanent, others temporary. To get a little more information on it, let's talk to the events coordinator, Liz Sanders. Come on. Liz, this glass mulch is amazing and it, it creates a path that connects us to the sculpture. It's really beautiful. It was done by a, a company called Greener Living Sustainable Solutions and they actually apply it barefoot. You, <laughs> you could walk on it barefoot. Well, right there's now. a real testimonial <laughs> that it won't cut you. Exactly. So I guess the glass is tumbled so it it's is. soft. It is. It yeah. is. It's soft and it's all recycled. Um, so we're using something that's already there and it's beautiful. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this sculpture. Would this be part of your permanent collection or is this one that's temporary? This is a part of the permanent collection. This was nice. uh, donated by Michael Warwick. Yeah. He's a local artist and he's been invested in the garden for a long time. So yeah. most of the sculpture come from people from this area That's and right. around? We just recently opened up the competition of sculptures to regional artists, but ah. for, the, for a long time it's really been Arkansas only and in those the are the state. ones we yeah. really want to enter as much as possible. Well, you know, this whole concept of having a sculpture garden that can be used as an event space and also mm -hmm. serve as a garden for the community community mm -hmm. is really a marvelous model it that is. other communities could follow. I, I definitely believe it. So Liz, this is such a large area. You have a lot of activity here. How do you all keep up with it from a staffing standpoint? That's a good question. Um, we do have a small paid staff um, and you met Laverne earlier and she's the master gardener along with She's uh, doing her a beautiful job here. with all the plants. Exactly. She really is incredible. And uh, I do a lot of the event planning um, and we have another woman who really helps with promotions and advertising. That's so we, uh, we're a small group. Keep Keep it small and successful. Yeah, we do our best. Well, congratulations. It's really inspiring. Thank you so much. The Garfield Park Conservatory in Chicago is one of the largest, and I have to say, most impressive conservatories in the nation. The Monet Garden is one of their outdoor displays, and it's an adaptation of the Impressionist painter Claude Monet's well-known garden at Giverny, France. Steve Meyer tells us more about this beautiful space. Steve, this has to be one of the most popular places for people to visit, children and adults alike. It is. Experiencing Monet in a garden that I think yeah. he would have very much appreciated. Yeah, right here in Chicago. The iconic walk with the arches and oh, so yeah. forth, everyone knows. He used a different plant palette. It looks to me as though you've adapted plants that work really well for you here in Chicago. Yeah, we have to do that because actually different climate conditions that we right. have here than sure. at Chivernay. 
So we do a uh, little changing every year, so it's always different. So I see. Have to see. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, Steve, this strikes me as such a great example of taking an idea and interpreting it in your own way, and it's something anyone who has a garden, a home garden, can do. Oh, yes, they can. It's very easy to do this. Yeah. Uh, well, design. you've just got a beautiful arrangement of annuals. There are all kinds of uh, marigolds and zinnias, grasses, the kale. Uh, it all works very well. And you've painted with a broad brush, if you will, uh, with these big, uh, bold blocks of color. If you squint your eyes and look at it, it looks very much like an impressionist painting. Yes, it does, because we're using the complementary colors here. We're also using color and texture also, right. and form. So, so, so you've got the complementary colors being the yellow set, at, the bright yellows of the marigolds set against the deep purples of the kale. Right, that's yeah. what, we, what we were looking for. We're looking for that uh, artistic look to it. Yeah, well, it's marvelous. Now, this is actually a bit of a garden room because if you, there's a path on either side of the central axis. Correct. Yeah, and over here we have the espaliers that uh, define the edge. And then over here, I think it's very interesting how, even though that's an administration building, you're covering it with vines so it doesn't become a distraction. Right, we want to block that out so the visitor has that visual thing of being in its own separate room. Right, focusing mm -hmm. just here on this. Yes. Yeah. But what a simple design, but it's so effective. Well, thank you. You know, I love to go to places and find new ideas. Lots of people here today enjoying this beautiful place in Chicago. But you know, what's so interesting about this and I want to share this with you because it's a great problem solver, is that this is a wall of plants. Why a wall of plants? Well, in this case, they're hiding a building that is sort of a visual eyesore. You see, what you have here is a beautiful representation of Monet's garden at Giverny. There's lots of school kids here today to take a look at it. But what I want to do is not only give you a glimpse of this garden, but show you how they've cleverly hidden this building. It doesn't really fit the design, and so they've done this wall of plants that you can actually do in your own home. Now let's talk about the mechanics and the fundamentals of it before we get to the plants, which that's the part I really love. If you look closely, you'll see there's a series of these units, and each unit has 16 pockets for planting. These extend about 10 inches out from the wall, and there's a drip line that runs across the top here, and here, and here, and here, and there's a slow drip of water and fertilizer that feed these plants. They're packed in with a potting soil, one blended for container gardening, and then there's a filter fabric or landscape fabric that helps hold those into place. This is a south-facing wall so they get plenty of light, which will dictate the type of plants that you choose to plant here. It's a living wall, and what they've used here to enliven this wall are these beautiful pink dragon wing begonias, and this Carax called Frosty Curls. And then over here is this lovely Gara with its ethereal pink blooms, and then even vegetables growing here. But one of the benefits of having a living wall like this against a building is it help cuts down on the amount of radiation and heat buildup in the building. If you do this, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you mount this wall on something that's very sturdy and solid, something that can take moisture. Probably a wood wall wouldn't work unless there's a nice space between it so you can get plenty of air circulation. If you don't have a lot of space, gardening on the vertical like this, it's the deal. Give it a try. I'm building this house because I believe that you can build quality, affordable, comfortable housing that that's, has a sustainable component to it in a reasonable number of days. And, uh, and I absolutely love a challenge too. But you know, you have to start with the right plan, you have to pick the right materials, and of course you have to have the right team to pull this off.
Well, as you can see, we're moving right along, and for the first time, you can see the actual footprint of the house. Looking pretty good, isn't it? I'm actually standing on what will be the front porch out here, and I'm gonna step through the front door into the house. And what we have here is a house that's 40 feet long, and we have 26 feet coming down on the side, and we come across 26 feet. We notch out here in the middle. We go out eight feet and then 16 feet along that south face. So this will be a notch that'll be covered over the roof. You'll see it a little later in the show. But what's happened today is that we've been moving rocks. We got all the rocks out of here. Uh, Tony and the guys graded this off. So we've got a nice smooth pad. And if you look down here, you can see we've got some pretty good soil. Now it's been graded off, but <laughs> don't be fooled. Right under this is solid rock. So we've got a thin layer of this and I'm gonna have to deal with the erosion issues fairly soon here. You can see we've pushed everything down here to the end the tops of the trees. We've got also um, some of the stumps and things like that. We've tried to keep as much topsoil here as we possibly can. We've got the pine logs stacked up over here on this end. So you can see we've got the house pretty well positioned. You can see the lot is only 50 feet wide, so we cleared just the minimum number of trees that we needed to. Now come up here, I wanna show you something important. So look right here, you can see we've probably harvested, I guess probably four tons of rock. That looks dusty right now, but when the rain hits that, it's really got a beautiful color to it. And we'll put this rock to work. I'm not sure where we'll use it. We won't use it on the house, but we'll probably use it somehow in the garden or help control erosion somehow. But I like to save everything we can off the site. Then if you look over here, just take a look at all this timber that came off of it. Now they're not huge logs, but these pine logs be able to go to the sawmill. We'll be able to cut this lumber out. We'll either use it directly on the house or I'll trade it out with my buddy with something that he's got that we can use, but we just didn't want these logs to go to waste. What we have here are about 40 logs that are about, well, at least 16 feet long. So these look great, I'm excited about this. Now come over here, just wanna show you something we had to do in order to get started. And it's something, if you start a construction project, you always need to call one call in your state and they come out and they mark where the utilities are. You can see we've got this white marking paint. They typically use white marking paint and here's the line of the utility right here, all the way down. They'll come down to your site within 48 hours after you call them. And the key here is you don't wanna get into any utilities and they don't want you to either because you could really cause some problems. So that's why it was important for us to get these buried power lines marked before we got out here with any kind of heavy equipment. As you can see, we're making some sweet progress. We've got the footprint of the house coming along. This is the part of the show where we take photographs that you send to me of some of your landscape projects and we throw around some ideas. Today we have a new house it was built in Indiana by Melanie. Melanie tells me that she loves cottage style and she's all about flowers. She loves roses, hydrangeas, you know, some of those classic plants. So it's a really beautiful house and what a green lawn, very nice. So we're starting out with a blank slate. Looks like we have a pair of purple leaf plum trees in the front that are basically symmetrical, uh, centered right here at the front. There's the front door here. So why don't we just begin to play with a few ideas? In Indiana, I think you're going to want as much evergreen as you can so you can enjoy them in the winter. I would start here at the very front, maybe do some sort of evergreen shrub. Now, Melanie, this could be boxwood. And what I might do is come over here to this corner and do another clump of them. And then maybe down here at this end, sort of framing the house. Um, looks like you're on a gravel road. So I'm thinking uh, rather than gravel being thrown up here, it might be nice to have a hedge. I'd like for you to think about a wonderful hydrangea because you said you liked hydrangeas across the front here. Now there's a, one that's the old fashioned PG hydrangea that's been improved. You've seen limelight, which is a extraordinary bloomer, but they've come out with one called little lime. And these could be little lime hydrangeas all along here, which would bloom for you throughout the entire summer. They'd be creamy white. You'd have dark green here and here. Then let's move up to the house. I think we probably need something to anchor this corner. Maybe a columnar U there, one there, one here, 
and then maybe one here on this side like that. And then I'm thinking these boxwoods would repeat that up here by the front door as you can see here. Now you have this path coming along the edge and you've already established a flower bed there. So let's not mess with that. It's a little hard for me to tell how far it is out from the house, but I think the more generous those beds can be, the better. But in this case, we're just gonna leave them where they are. You mentioned you like roses. So what I'd like for you to do is play around with this uh, juxtaposition of evergreens and deciduous plants. I'd like to add to the roses spireas. What I'm thinking is if you did a big bank of knockout roses here and a big bank of knockout roses here, you would get a nice balance. And I love that pale pink one called blush knockout. And I think it would work well with your stone and your brick. You have brick surrounding the window here and brick over here. It's a soft pink. And then come along in front with some spirea. Some other accents in your area, if you um, actually do well with rhododendron, I don't know which direction your house faces, but you know, back here, in this deeper bed, a rhododendron here, and then maybe a rhododendron over here, uh, just to the back of those spireas, and then maybe in this bed, a Japanese maple that's red colored that would go with this sort of burgundy color you have here, might be something to think about. Also, Melanie, on this side, it looks like you have a, a, a field next to you. Along your property line, you might plant some of those uh, tall arbovitas along here to help frame the house. Well, those are just a few basic ideas. Uh, by having a border in the front, uh, you're gonna get more of that cottage look. If you wanna add a few flowers, some perennials in here, uh, catnip along the front would be fantastic. I love Walker's Low. There's one called Six Hills Giant. Um, so just consider some of those in there. Everything I've talked about is a perennial or a shrub. So this landscape gives you a backdrop uh, where you could come in and add, you know, super tunias or any sort of annual you like. Good luck with your project. Now I really enjoy finding ordinary things that are very affordable, classic in the look, and use them in creative ways. For instance, these cylinder vases, you can do a million different things with them. They're a lot of fun to dress up for various occasions and as gifts. So what I've done here is I've taken one and rather than cover it, I've just filled it with various kinds of citrus, lemons and lime slices here with just a bouquet of yellow mums, bright and perky and very affordable. And take a look at this vase. I just took some purple ribbon, got a little green band on it, and I wrapped it all the way around the cylinder vase, tied a little green raffia at the top, and filled it with these mauve-colored tulips. A beautiful gift. And then what I'm doing here, I just wanna show you how you can take ordinary ribbon and just attach your ribbon. I like to start at the bottom. And I'll just fold a piece of ribbon like that and attach the ribbon here, and then just gently turn the vase. And just keep a little tension on it takes more ribbon than you might imagine. This is really a fun polka dot ribbon that I'm gonna take all the way to the top. You want just enough overlap. Take a pair of scissors and cut it off like this, and then carefully just slide it under there so it adheres to the vase itself and the ribbon. And then pull it across like that. Now you can decorate that up just about any way you like. Now take a look at this one. I've been taking just some various twigs of different colors and I've used this natural jute and I'm gonna tie this around. So if you're doing some sort of a dinner party or you're looking for ways to set a table for a rehearsal dinner or something like that, these are affordable and creative ways to do flower vases. Let me add some water first. And then if you take something like these gorgeous hyacinths that have a tendency to flop anyway. Keep them banded at the base, and then I just gently slide the hyacinths in there, and these natural twigs will help give this some support. As you can see, by taking something ordinary and applying a little imagination to it, you can come up with some extraordinary things.
Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for the show. I have certainly enjoyed my time here in St. Louis, and I hope as you travel around, you pick up ideas for your home and garden. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.